Thanks everyone for coming here. Um, I'm Nick Matthews. I'm a solutions architect with the 9K and ACI group. Um, I kind of got started with this concept in uh, Atlanta, where I'm from. I run a uh, users group there called the Network Programmability Users Group, or, or NPUG. So this is kind of a, a lot of thoughts and concepts that I've gotten from uh, the customers and partners, and employees, and, and peers of mine that uh, you know they're constantly being asked, you know, what should we do about this SDN stuff? Uh, we're being asked to program, do we need to become developers? Uh, and what's going on in the industry here? Um, so my background is I'm not a programmer. I'm a, I'm a network guy. I, I do have my CCIE, got that six or seven years ago on route switch, did some voice stuff since then, and the last couple of years I've been really kind of honing in and focusing in on this concept of SDN and programmability. So it's not like I'm a developer here, I've been helping out the DevNet guys. Um, so you're in the right place if you're interested in hearing about this kind of concept, the DevNet area here is very, very interesting for uh, network people trying to figure out if they should become programmers or not, or how much do you actually need to learn how to program. Uh, so we'll, we'll get started here. Uh, one of the problems is that this is the stuff we know, right? 6500, routers, conf T, right? This all kind of fills us with warmth. We're all networkers, right? Um, and there's a very well kind of defined path. We know that if we want to rise up the food chain of network engineering, you go get your NA, your NP, and your, your CCIE if, if you're bold and daring, right? So uh, how many people have CCIEs in the, in the audience here? All right, how many people are working towards a CCIE? All right, and then the scary future stuff. Uh, how many guys are, know how to write Python? Okay. Uh, how many of you guys are fluent in some type of programming language? All right, how many of you guys are looking at becoming in, more into programming concepts? Okay, so hands kind of all over the place, right? So we've got a little bit of, little bit of both. Um, and that's, that's pretty typical. So the problem here is that you know, you've got some magical stuff that people don't really know if it works or not, like the cloud, uh, cool new stuff like Go, who knew, actually knows that. Um, and a lot of words that we're not really familiar with is network people. These are application people problems. And we don't like the application people because they don't know the network and they, it's very, very frustrating working with them. And yet their concepts are now starting to kind of come into our, our domain and what we're supposed to do with it. And on top of that, uh, there's not a real clear way. If you want to become a SDN expert, if you want to become a network programmer going forward, how do you, how do, you do that, right? There's not uh, a very clear lineage of you know, how do you rise up that stack? What are you supposed to learn? There's no one out there saying, these are the seven things, these are the eight books you have to read in order to go become the next great thing, right? We all know how to do that in networking. Uh, you know, CCI Data Center was just released recently. Um, you know, that's still kind of new and hot, but then People are looking at this and they go, well, maybe this is, maybe this is cooler. Uh, so, you know, the, one of the, the quick spoilers here is we are in the DevNet zone, right? I'm a little bit biased towards the programmability stuff. So uh, if you want to hear a lot of the cool stuff about what the CCIE is going on, there's a lot of the learning at Cisco people here, um, and they, they have another perspective to give you, right? So there's been a couple other sessions that you can go look at uh, from the, the learning at Cisco perspective. Um, I think we mostly agree. And, so if we take a look at the major problem here, right, is, you know, the CCIE is, you know, it's kind of uh, winner take all, right? So if you either get it, uh, you put the 1,000 hours in. I, um, you know, I did it. I, I thought it was a very worthwhile point of my time. But it's, you know, you have to put those hours in. And at the end, great, you're a CCIE. You know, you get a couple of different job offers a week on LinkedIn or whatever. And it's, it's really awesome being a CCIE. But if it, you're studying for it right now and you're saying, well, do I, should I go study the, the programmability concept instead? It's a pretty difficult conversation to, to get through. Uh, and then also, you know, there's like a whole bunch of CCIEs in the room. You know, you go for a second or you start learning, learning Python. So this is nothing new, right? We're used to this. We're a culture of learning. If you don't continue to learn, uh, eventually you're kind of managed out or kind of aged out of the IT infrastructure, right? So you can never really stop learning in this environment. Uh, so we say, okay, well, how is this different from when we did UCS or when virtualization came around or any of those other kinds of problems? So if we go back, and I call this guy the, the Pac-Man of, of, uh, of you know, takeovers, right? So uh, back in the, you know, the dinosaur ages of, of networking, Cisco went out and picked a fight against all the protocols that weren't TCP IP and decided that they were all going to become Ethernet and TCP IP, right? 
Um, and I'll use the word dinosaur here lovingly, right? Because uh, the people that have been doing this for a long time find, find pride in that. And I, we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, so the, the network got bigger and larger. We picked some more fights, right? We went out and picked a fight against the, the voice people, the Avaya, the Nortels, and the Siemens of the world. And we said, we're going to put your complicated telephony stuff on our network because the network's more important. It's more, uh, it's out there, right? We can do a lot more with the network than you can with your, you know, two wire pairs and PRIs and tie lines and big, huge mainframe looking uh, phone systems, right? Uh, and that wasn't, you know, that wasn't met without a little bit of pressure, right? The phone guy said, well, my phone system never goes down. It will never go down. You can never get it run on your IP network. Your IP network goes down all the time. My internet connection's down. It's flaky. You'll never, ever get a, re a consistent, reliable phone system on TCP IP, right? And so all of those guys are you know, going and doing punch down blocks. They said, I'm not going to go learn IP and DHCP and CDP and routing and switching stuff because I'll be punching down phone cables forever, right? Well, I, I think we're in a similar kind of mindset for a lot of people saying, well, we can't we can't possibly give my network code to a Java programmer. Their Java code crashes constantly, and it can't go anywhere. It's not scalable, and it's not reliable, and that'll never happen. So I think a lot of the same, and that's, that's because there's a big difference between when you're the consumer versus you know, the person being, you know, getting picked on in the fight. Uh, they, have a much, they have a much smaller perspective of what's actually possible than the people picking the fight, right? Uh, and so we went out there, and we picked some more fights. Uh, the network got larger and larger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so we did fiber channel and storage. Uh, those are more or less prolific out there in the data center space. Uh, we got, did have to do a little bit of cannibalization. We started doing a little more virtual switching, so taking some more physical switching and putting it into the virtual network, right? That's the, the hypervisor stuff that's been going on. Um, so it's, it's all kind of gotten bigger over time, but I think what's happening here with this concept of SDN and what we're really facing is that uh, we're not the people picking this fight, right? We, are, we were the people on the right before that we were making fun of. And we said, you know, well, well software people, they'll never get networking right. They'll never get this right. Um, and I think that changes the way you have to approach the, the concepts that these people are espousing, right? They say, um, well, you know, everything should be Java code or Python code or everything needs to be in, in our software way of things. And we're like, no, it doesn't. We've been doing it manually for years, and it works great, mostly. Uh, so I think you know, the real hard part is, if you're the telephony guy and you're saying, you know, I'm not going to learn TCP IP until my company decides to put in a voice over IP phone system, right? Cisco buys Celsius, three, four, five, six, seven years later. Uh, they come in, they say, we're going to put in a voice over IP telephony system in our company. And your, your punch down guys, your telephony guys, like, okay, maybe I'll go read a, you know, a CCNA book. You know, six months later, that phone system's in, and they go, well, actually, we found some, I, some guy in IT. He apparently just learned telephony in six months, so we don't really need you anymore. Right? That's kind of an exaggeration, but still, uh, that's the whole concept. If you wait for the, the technology to be here, um, because we're not really the people pushing the agenda and, and the schedule, um, it's kind of a dangerous, I think it's a more dangerous transition than what we've seen before even though we've seen quite a few transitions. So if we take a look at the, the mechanics of Mr. Pac-Man here and, and figure out how does this, this software stuff work and what do we have to worry about, uh, you know, the, the Mark Andreessen says software is eating the world, right? Software has absolutely taken over so many industries and it's gigantic, right? You know, ask, uh, ask some of the bookstores how they're doing or the post office or uh, some of the the gambling places, or I don't know, anything in the last 20 years that's become digitalized. Uh, the software world has kind of revolutionized those things. So they're, they're very used to this. There's a, there's a lot of technology, people, processes, resources, tools, and languages that they have at their disposal, which we should consider an opportunity uh, so that we can use those tools, use those resources for our infrastructure requirements. Uh, another side of things, uh, they're used to rapid change. They're used to a new programming language every three months or three years, right? They're, we're not used to those things. We don't get a lot of new network protocols that we have to use every day or can use every day. And uh, it, as it pertains to the CCIE, they don't have a culture of certifications. Uh, you know, I was perusing some of the stuff on Amazon for learning how to program, because again, I'm not a programmer, and one of the most commonly bought books out there is, you know, the answers to Google's 100 most common 
uh, software interview questions where you have to write some sorting algorithm on a whiteboard because, again, they can't just say, oh, well, you're a Python certified professional, right? They don't really believe in the same levels of certifications, probably, again, because of the, the rapid change and just how broad the software industry is. So as, you know, within Cisco, I think we have an opportunity to do that for network programming, but the industry as a whole doesn't have that. But if you take a look at it from another perspective, whenever we acquired voice or IP, for instance, into networking, it complexified, that's a real word, uh, it complexified our, our environment. We had to do a lot of quality of service, and we actually inherited a little bit more uh, network characteristics to handle voice or IP. So there's a chance that when we get a, acquired into software that we'll bring some of our special characteristics along as well. Maybe certifications come along. So if you take a look at, OK, I do network engineering. Maybe I'm a CCIE. Maybe I'm interested in SDN. What's the path to developer, right? So just because you're doing SDN or are interested in it or know something about it doesn't make you a developer, right? There's a path that way. And on the other end, right, we're in the DevNet, so there might be some developers out there. If you're on the developer side of things and you're looking to get towards SDN, maybe you need to learn a little networking. Um, so it's, it's kind of a bit of the middle. And you can get to SDN, you can learn the SDN, but then you still have to go a little bit further to learn a bit about the software development life cycle or uh, the methodologies and tools that are used. So once you get down that path, you start going down, chugging down that, that line there, you'll start to encounter a lot of really weird words. It's an intimidating place. The, the more that you think you learn some words, the more you realize there's a lot of more words out there you don't know. And you start getting comfortable. You're like, you know what? I'm kind of an SDN expert. I know a lot of words. When people start talking about SDN, I know what they're talking about, even though they're trying to scare me by dropping down a lot of words I don't understand. And then you find out there's a lot more out there that you still don't know. Um, and so it's, it's actually very, very confusing for most people. Uh, and it creates a lot of confusion and doubt. And in my mind, I think it's slowed down a lot of the parts of the industry. Um, so you know, within my users group and my customers and the people I try to work with, on this programmability concept, I try to kind of bust a few kind of common myths people have, right? The first one is, you know, I've got to be a programmer. Uh, so I'm from the United States, so I tell people it's more like a trip to Mexico, right? If you're going to go to Mexico, um, Cancun maybe, uh, you don't have to learn Spanish to go there, right? Most everyone speaks a little bit of English. Uh, but if you learn just a little bit of Spanish, then uh, you'll have a better time, right? We say una mas cerveza, that's because we're not very good at Spanish, but you know, it, it gets the job done, right? Um, and the analogy there is that if you're a network guy and you learn a little bit of the software stuff, then you can have that conversation with someone else that is maybe more application focused or software focused. Uh, and you can express the ways, if you're the dinosaur that knows all of the networking knowledge, you can express that knowledge to someone that, that can help put it into code, right? And you guys both win through that exercise. Or you know, if you talk to the, the DevOps model where the developers and the operators kind of come together to create solutions, it's all about some common terminology, right? Knowing how an API works or knowing uh, some of the challenges they're going to face whenever they try to program uh, your workflow, right? And, and because we're in Italy and not the not United States, right? You know, I, I tried to learn a little bit of Italian for this trip. Um, so it would be un altro. Bicchiere de vino per favore. So if you, only learn, you can learn one thing today, if you don't take anything else, this is how you another, order another glass of wine, um, because we are in Italy. Uh, the other one we get is, it's going to take my job away. right? If, if I tell some programmer what I do every day, then they're going to take my job, or someone else is going to take my job. Um, the interesting thing about this is that in the, the whole DevOps myth methodology, right? it's mostly around sysadmins creating a lot of automation. That's a very simple description. But I think if you look at the DevOps people, they didn't get rid of any jobs. They just started running better IT companies, right? And they became more efficient, became had higher uptime, and those kinds of things. Um, I mean, that's not to say that some people aren't going to be out of jobs. If, if you, I'll put it this way, if you start learning the automation stuff, you start learning the scripting, you start teaming up with people that are able to help deliver those solutions, you're not going to be the one that's losing the job, at least, right? Uh, but, I mean, you've seen a lot of stuff about automation in the press. There's a lot of jobs that are being out there automated. I don't think that networkers are really at, at full risk um, because there, there's still a lot of com complexity there. Um, I like to tell people, as much as we talk about the future, uh, people still send faxes, right? Uh, <laughs> email's been around for 25 years. It's a very good protocol. It works. 
people still send faxes, right? So things aren't going to change overnight despite how much we want them to. Uh, and then some people say, you know what? Okay, I get it. I, Nick, what you're talking about makes sense. Teach it to me. I want to learn it. Teach me the SDN. I, I want to be the SDN guy. Um, and so we know the OSI model here. They're like, maybe it's just layer eight, right? We, we know that's not true because that's politics or money or religion, depending upon what you believe in. Um, but that's really not the right approach. It's not an application, not above that. Um, and then some people say, well, someone told me it's about separating the control plane and the data plane, right? That's it, and there's applications and a REST API, that's SDN, that's what I need to know? Eh, not really. I mean, uh, the, the whole industry has kind of become a lot more involved and complicated than that, right? So, you know, this is kind of an architecture diagram I put together, right? Because Cisco people like putting boxes in front, inside of boxes with labels with different colors, and I'm sure you guys have seen those slides this week. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all this. I went through it in a different session, kind of. You can come by the SDN booth and we can talk about it. But um, that's kind of what I think a high-level architecture of what the SDN architecture is today. Uh, but even then, this isn't really accurate because the, the southbound APIs are also the same thing as the northbound APIs. So there's nothing really preventing us from stacking this, this green kind of magic layer on top of each other, right? So then you can have something like Puppet that it's going to be using APIs to talk to OpenStack, which then you know, it's going to be talking APIs to talk to APIC, right? So even this isn't a really truly accurate diagram because of the ways you can stack this all together. So you can almost consider the, the REST APIs of our orchestration layers as almost like the Linux pipe command, right? We can pipe all of these different components in and around each other. So it's very modular and it's very flexible. So it's kind of like you can't say, what is this? How do you use a bash script? Right? I mean, there's a lot of ways to use a Bash script. I'm sure there's some $2 million application somewhere running on a Bash script. Um, so it's very, very flexible. And that's why there's a lot of confusion around SDN. Um, see here? So if you take a look at it, right, going, getting back to some of the CCI stuff, we say that you know, SDN is going to make our network very pretty and it's fancy and everything is going to be the unicorn. It's going to solve all of our problems. Um, so that's what we need to go focus on. But if you take a look at the truth here, when you get down in underneath all this frosting and stuff, uh, it's our typical network stuff, right? It's still running TCP IP, it's still doing routing, it's still doing switching, it's still going to break, right? Um, and they're going to, you know who they're going to call when their big complicated network breaks is the CCIE, right? So the CCIE and the networking fundamentals are not going anywhere, right? No one's recreated, uh, you know, MAC addresses and switching or routing. Um, they might call it VLAN or VXLAN switching or VXLAN routing, but this, the concepts are more or less there. Uh, and if you know the networking background, all this stuff is going to make a lot more sense. As well, if you, know, if you don't have the networking background, if you want to try to do some of the more complicated networking stuff, uh, you're not going to be there either. So if you're still coming up the networking ranks, it's still a good idea to keep going up those ways rather than just saying, I'm going to become a developer, right? Uh, if you take a look at some of the Cisco certifications that are out there, uh, there is a network programmability track. Right, so uh, right now they're more in the kind of the specialist categories. They haven't created like the, the CCNA kind of equivalent or CCMP or, or the CCIE equivalent yet, uh, but they're out there. Um, and I think my opinion is, you know, they have to be kind of deliberately conservative because you can't go out there and create certifications unless there's actual business value and people are going to pay for that. And seeing as how the industry is still evolving very quickly, a lot of the certifications haven't really been um, kind of solid yet. So it's what we've seen and most other parts of Cisco, it takes some time for those certifications to kind of mature and for that to appear, but um, there's always going to be the people uh, that go out there and do it before that, right? There was wireless experts before the CCI wireless. There was UCS experts before the CCI data center. Uh, and my personal opinion is that not everyone's going to be this kind of um, software network hybrid kind of person, right? There's going to be people that just stay network, and, and there's going to be people that want to go do these kind of things. Uh, if you've got a software background or if you have some software friends, I don't know, um, if you just truly believe in it, then maybe you'll come out here and, and this is the path that's right for you, right? And that's kind of what we're trying to figure out. So if you do say, all right, well, this sounds great. I want to get on board. You've kind of convinced me. What do I go learn, right? You know, it goes back to the whole teach me SDN thing. Um, and the, and the, what we've really come to a conclusion is there's some pretty core technologies there that uh, you can go learn that are pretty fundamental to going on to other things later. 
right? So for instance, um, we talked a lot, I talk a lot about Python, but it doesn't have to be Python, right? Python's kind of the networking language because it's easy and they use white spaces, it doesn't require a compiler, there's a big community around it, a lot of the uh, tools are, are built around Python. Uh, so it's, got a, it's kind of an easy stepping stone for us. But if you're a Java guy or you like Tickle or you like Perl or you like something else, um, that's great because a lot of it's just about understanding the way that software works, right? Writing code, understanding some of those basic concepts. Um, Another good thing is almost all these things are open source, right? So the open source community is very good about helping each other uh, learn those kinds of things. Uh, and then depending upon kind of your vertical or where you're at, you can kind of go deeper into all the other technologies, right? So part of the core, I would say, is just becoming familiarity, f familiar with the rest of the concepts. Um, so if, once you get familiar with them, you kind of figure out what's right for you, what's right for your business, what do you care about, what is your business wanting to do, and you can go down these, I mean, each, each one of these can be, people have developed their careers and each one of these individually. Um, so you can kind of choose one, dig in, or, or whatever you'd like to do there. So if we kind of wrap it up a bit, you know, I, I said a bunch of things, uh, but it wasn't, there wasn't a real clear action item. And that's because with, like any sufficiently complex question, uh, the answer is always gonna be it depends, right? So if you're a CCIE, should you go get a second one or should, should you go get another uh, should you go learn Python? I think that uh, the scripting skills are becoming a requirement for a lot of the, or at least a want to have, for a lot of the senior network uh, positions, right? So if you want to become more senior, maybe it's a great place to do that. Um, if you don't have the networking experience, but you want to maybe enhance your career, you can go get the CCIE or, or start learning some of the programming stuff, but the CCIE is probably a little bit uh, more predictable, right? Uh, if you want to get more business traction, right? If you want to stop being the plumber in your company and you want to start kind of showing some value, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit by teaming up with some of the developers or learning some yourself or the, the new network guy in your team that knows Python but he's an idiot on the network. Um, you can team up with him and try to create something together, right? Uh, if you're a developer, maybe you learn a little bit of, of Python. So there's not a great answer for, for anyone, right? But I think that more and more people really need to start at least putting a little more thought into the program buddy aspect. So I mean, you guys are all here, so I think you guys are probably on board with that. Um, there's a lot of DevNet stuff back here. If you want to go learn how to do a REST API, there's the learning labs in the back. Um, otherwise, wander around. And I know sessions start at 2.32, so um, thank you, everybody.